When Jeff Comes Home, Chapter 5. Dad woke me at ten the next morning, shaking my shoulder gently. I looked up at him, bleary-eyed. I had sat up most of the night, allowing myself to fall into sleep only as dawn approached. Time to get up, Jeff, he said, smiling. Come downstairs and have some breakfast. Good morning, honey. Connie greeted me as I walked into the kitchen. I noticed the fine lines under her eyes, more than I remembered from before. Morning, Connie. You look tired, I said, then blushed. I'm sorry. I mean, you look good, just tired. I stood awkwardly against the counter, suddenly shy with her. Connie smiled. Actually, this morning I'm not. Usually on Saturdays, I have to get up at 5.30 to take Charlie to her job at the stables. But Dave drove her today, and I slept in till 8. Can I get you something? You don't have to. I don't know. Cereal's okay. She nodded and brought down a box of rice checks from one of the cabinets. Charlie has a job? Yes, she works at the fairgrounds, weekend mornings, grooming and exercising the horses. Charlie went out and got the job on her own. We were shocked. She's usually so quiet and moody. The job has been wonderful for her, though. How long has she, has she worked there? I asked, taking the bowl of cereal from Connie. About three months, I guess, since the end of summer. Vin Perini works there, too. Weekday mornings, mostly, but sometimes on weekends with Charlie. She's so shy when she sees him. It's cute. Connie laughed. Oh, she'd kill me if she heard me say that. Jeff, aren't you hungry? I had set the bowl on the counter without taking a bite. I could not remember the last time I had thought of Vinny. Getting used to my family again was one thing, but thinking of Vinny, of the complications of getting to know him again, at the process of reacquainting reacquainting myself with kids my own age, school. The thought of the weeks and months to come overwhelmed me. Are you okay? I realized Connie had spoken twice to me without my answering. She touched my arm. Yeah, I guess I'm still tired. Have you eaten yet? Dad strode into the room. No? Bring your bowl into the office. Dave wants to talk to you. I didn't move. Come on, there's no better time. Charlie's out. Connie's taking Brian shopping with her. Let's get this over with. Wordlessly, I followed him to his office. The room looked the same as I remembered it, with the addition of some embarrassingly large photos of me. I lingered in front of one. It was me right after pitching a no-hitter in a Little League Championship game. Vinny was in the foreground among my teammates congratulating me. Dad laughed awkwardly. Nice, huh? I bought a copy of the Telegraph and had it enlarged. Bought a copy from the Telegraph and had it enlarged. That was some day, remember? Yeah, I said, trailing off, disturbed by the picture. Stevens walked into the room. We'll have to get some new pictures of you, Dad said. You, you've grown up since then. Stevens cleared his throat. Can you mind getting me some coffee? Coffee? Dad hesitated a moment, watching me. Sure. I watched him go, not sure whether I was relieved or scared to be free of him. Would it be easier on you if your dad wasn't here for this? Stephen's voice was quiet. I put the cereal bowl on the ed end table and sat down, <clears throat> avoiding his eyes. I'm not going to say anything, so it doesn't matter. But if you do say something, Stephen said patiently, would you prefer he not be here? I shrugged, trying to hide my panic. Stephen's left the room. I covered my ears, not wanting to hear the explanation he would give to dad. I lowered my hands quickly as Stevens lumbered back into the room. He pulled Dad's office chair over to the couch where I sat and perched on it, towering over me. First, please call me Dave. Everyone does. I glanced up at him. The man looked like a movie version of a bodyguard, the big dumb guy who backs up the slick villain. I held on to the image to keep my fear at bay. You're from the FBI? That's right. And you let everyone call you Dave? Or is it just crime victims? He smiled wearily at me. Okay, forget the pleasantries. Was any of that story true last night? Yes, I admitted, but I looked away, laughing a little. The thing is, I'm not going to talk. The guy's not coming back, okay? He, he left me off, I'm here, end of story. Uh-uh, Stephen said, still smiling. An awful lot of people expended... A lot of time and energy on you over the past few years. They want some return 
on their investment, so do I. I looked at him as if he was insane. What are you talking about? You mean people tried to find me and all that? Yup, all that. Ask your dad sometime. Yeah, well, I never saw any of it, I told him hotly, then looked away, frowning. Why not? He keep you confined or what? I looked back at the man. Hey, I'm not stupid. You're not going to trip me up that way. I'm not talking, so you can just go back. I know you're not stupid. In fact, I understand you used to be the perfect kid. Polite, respectful, good student, star athlete. He ticked the qualities off one by one on his fingers. I squirmed. Is there something wrong with that? He smiled a little. The perfect kid with the perfect life. That's what your dad kept insisting. No problems at school, none at home, no reason to run. You thought I ran away? I came onto your case the third day, Stevens said, and only because Ken made such a stink. There's a knee-jerk response in law enforcement that kids over 10 who go missing are probably runaways. Here you were, almost 14, so... I felt sick. Here was my fear made flesh. Is that what you thought? I'm not big into knee-jerk re responses, Stevens gave me a quick smile. But if you didn't run, what happened to you? You were just gone. One of the most frustrating cases I've, I ever worked. I watched him, not sure where he was going with this. So, where were you? I shrugged, my stomach churning. Aside from everything else, I'm curious as hell. You know we never came up with one solid lead about you. I finally figured you were so far underground that unless someone confessed, we were never going to find you. What do you mean, underground? I asked. Dead? He nodded. Dead or dead to the world, anyway. Was I right? I don't know what you want me to say. Simple. Where have you been for the last two and a half years? I was silent. Try this, then. Who kidnapped you? I looked down, shaking my head. What if he comes back? He won't. You sure? He came back once already to drop off your clothes. He's done. He won't come back. You know something. You're right. Stephen said slowly. He probably won't come back for you. Brian, though. He's what, eleven? Don't, I said, knowing what he was doing, reacting anyway. Face it, Jeff. If it's not Brian, it'll be some other kid. You want to be responsible for that? I stared at him, furious. It's not my job to catch him. It's yours. I'm not responsible for what he does. You're the last known contact with this man. I'm not leaving until you tell me how to find him. I don't know how to find him. I can't help you. I looked down, miserable, my arms folded across my chest, one foot tapping nervously. The silence went on so long I had to look up. Stevens was staring at me, looking disgusted and angry too. I'm sorry, I said, shuddering involuntarily. I moved to get up, to leave him. Stevens reacted immediately, pushing his chair forward, knocking my legs apart with his own, clamping his hands on my thighs and leaning into me. You're not getting out of it this easy. He hissed, inches from my face. Now come on, what's the man's name? <sighs> Frozen, I could only blink at him. Just as I saw his face soften into a kind of regret, I was able to let out a strangled cry. Stevens pulled back immediately and stood up, cursing. Dad ran into the room so fast I knew he must have been just outside listening. He came swiftly to my side. What the hell is wrong with you? He yelled and I shivered before I realized he was talking to Stevens. If you treat him that way again, Dad continued, his voice quiet now, I'll take the kid and disappear and your case can go to hell. Look, I'm sorry, Stevens said. If we had the time, he could work through this at his own pace, but we don't. Jeff, the guy dropped you off Thursday night. It's Saturday morning now. Your kidnapper has had a full day and part of another to start this whole process again. Take some other kid, ruin his life, ruin his family's life, maybe kill him this time. We've got to stop him, you know that. I swallowed hard. I can't talk about him. You're embarrassed about the sex, I understand that. Stephen's tone was gentle now. I hid my face from him, from both of them. There was no sex, I mumbled. <laughs> well, I don't believe you, but let's set that aside for now. I need to know who kidnapped you, the best description you can give me. I don't need to know anything more now than who he is and how to find him. Dad squeezed my shoulder. Breathing deeply, I raised my head to look at Stevens. He goes by Ray. None of those other names I told you were true. Okay, Stevens said, sitting down again, a good distance from me this time. 
Is Ray his first or last name? I don't know. That's what he told me to call him, so... Stevens nodded. Do you know where he's heading? No. He did mention Nevada once, Las Vegas, but I don't know. Where did he keep you? I shook my head. Stevens watched me calmly, notepad out, poised to write. No, I can't say that. I kept my head down, but I was serious, no matter what they did to me. I can't. I dared to look up at Stevens. I won't. He sighed, thought about it for a moment, then nodded. What does Ray look like? How old is he? I don't know how old he is, I said, irritated, trapped, maybe 40. What does he look like? He has long black hair past his collar, brown eyes. He's tall, about six feet. Body type? Ray's thin, but he has muscles. He lifts weights. I flushed at that bit of information, cursing myself for giving Stevens more than he'd asked for. He remained expressionless, taking notes as I spoke. Does Ray have any scars, any identifying marks? He has a little scar above his left eyebrow. When he gets mad, it stands out white against his skin. I saw my hands were shaking and clasped them together in my lap. How did he bring you here? Car? Van? What? He has a Lexus. It's black. I don't know the license number. Stevens looked at me. I don't. Did he tell you anything about himself, his family, where he grew up, any personal details? He said he used to be a lawyer. He'd laugh about it. Dad released my shoulder, staring down at me. He talked about his ex-wife a few times, not her name, just, just that he'd been married once. Stevens nodded. Fine, that'll do for a start. Anything else, Jeff? Yeah. I looked at him, but the message was for Dad. <laughs> I know what you think about Ray, and you're wrong. He never touched me. Stevens nodded, turning to Dad. I want Jeff to come down to the city to look at mugshots. Why don't you bring the whole family, and we'll put you up at a nice hotel. This situation will be easier to control if you're out of town, isolated together, in a safe place. I can protect my family, Dad burst out, so suddenly I flinched. I know you can, Stevens said quietly. I'm not just talking about Ray here. The press will be around soon enough, and all the relatives and anyone else who ever knew Jeff will be wanting to see him. He's not ready for that yet. I ducked my head, embarrassed, hiding my face from both of them. All right, Dad said angrily. We'll go to the Bay Area then.